Hi, this is Mike Richmond. It's time for another mini-lesson in biostatistics. This mini-lesson is particularly for students in Math 221B biostatistics. When I'm doing a quantitative analysis and I have two samples, I need to figure out if they're paired or if they're independent from each other. For example, is this data point that comes from population A somehow related to this data point in population B, or are they independent of each other? Let's look at some examples. These examples aren't always going to be either paired or independent as listed here, but it gives you something to think about. Quite often studies will be done on twins. If you want to give a particular treatment to one group of individuals and forego that treatment for another group of individuals and you want to compare them to each other, quite often it's helpful to use twins because they have similar genetic makeup and identical DNA. So it can be helpful to eliminate lots of variation that would happen just among a uh, regular population of people. So twins are often used as a paired, um, a paired samples example. Another example is often we'll do pre and post testing on something. If you want to give some group of people maybe some sort of medical treatment and it's supposed to reduce cholesterol, for instance, you might want to measure their cholesterol before you give them the treatment and then measure the cholesterol on the same individual after you give them the treatment. That way, the two measures, the pre-measurement and the post-measurement, are attached to each other by being from that same individual. And in that case, you would probably want to uh, pair them up by individual. Another example is manufacturing athletic shoes. If you're a shoe manufacturer and you have uh, manufactured two new types of athletic shoes, you might want to compare how those athletic shoes perform against each other. Maybe you're looking at the wear on the tread or some other uh, variable that you can measure on the quality of the shoe. Well, you might be inclined to produce a bunch of pairs of shoes where one of the shoes is from uh, batch A and one of the shoes is from batch B, for instance, if you're comparing batch A against batch B. And then you would give each individual in your study a pair of shoes that was one shoe of each uh, on different feet, depending on how that was randomly pulled out. That way, you would expect that they would be wearing the shoes, both shoes at the same time, and it would help you to measure that up, to pair that up between the left and the right shoe, because someone who wore the shoes a lot and had a lot of wear and tear on them might give you a different result than somebody else who had very little wear and tear. You wouldn't be able to compare their left shoe versus their right shoe for the same individual, so you'd want to pair those measures up. Some examples of independent uh, variables, two sample variables, might be housing prices. Maybe I'm looking at housing prices in one city versus housing prices in another city. I really wouldn't have any reason to pair up those houses from one city to the next. Or maybe I'm looking at birth weights of babies born in different countries. There might not be any connection between babies in one country and babies in another country, and so I wouldn't have a reason to pair those up necessarily. <coughs> or I might be looking at calorie intake for individuals, and maybe I'm looking at swimmers versus track stars. Um, if I wanted to compare the calorie in intake between those two uh, samples, I wouldn't necessarily pair them up because Jenny's on the swim team at some university and I've got Ted who's on the track team at a different university. I wouldn't have necessarily any reason to pair those two up. Now maybe you're asking yourself, why should I care whether the two samples are paired or independent? What difference does it make? Well, pairing increases the sensitivity of a hypothesis test. So, if two samples can be paired and should be paired and you don't, well, that causes a problem. On the other hand, if they shouldn't be paired and you do, that also causes a problem. For example, if you're pairing when you shouldn't, that often makes the test too sensitive and it ignores a natural source of variation from, from subject to subject. On the other hand, if you're not pairing when you should, the test is not as sensitive as it could be because through pairing you can actually remove a source of variation in the results and your, your test can be a lot more sensitive between the two treatments on the pair. Okay, so let's. Here, this is a, a, a common practice and a good exercise to help you decide whether two samples are paired or independent. You can take 
any sort of uh, response variable. So may maybe we're looking at bike tire manufacturing. Maybe the bike tire manufacturer has manufactured two new bike tires and they want to do a comparison between them. So maybe they've got uh, uh, lot B and lot F are the two tires they've manufactured. You could do this one of two ways. You could make a bunch of bikes and put lot B tires in both the front and the rear tire on those bikes and do the same thing with a bunch of other bikes and put lot F tires on both the front and the rear. And then you could have uh, volunteers use the bike for six weeks and then you come back and you could measure the wear on the tread. Well, that would be one way of doing it and that would be a, an, an unpaired or an independent um, two sample independent test because you'd be comparing lot B versus lot F. Or you could do this, you could take each bike and you could put one tire from lot B and one tire from lot F on the same bike. That way you would have a paired situation where you'd have two samples in a paired t-test. Now why would you want to do that? Well, just like the athletic shoe example, if you had people who rode their bike a lot, you would expect there to be more wear on the tire. And so it would be nice to be able to compare a lot of wear from a lot B tire versus a lot of wear from a lot F tire, rather than just a whole bunch of lot B tires, some that have a lot of wear, some that don't, versus a whole bunch of lot B tires. This is one way of uh, making the test much more sensitive by removing one of the sources of variation. Another example is maybe you work for a, um, an athletic training company and you've come up with some methods that you think are going to increase the vertical leap of some of your athletes that are training with you. Well, the, here again, you could test this one of two ways. You could go ahead and grab a, a, a population of all the people that have already done the training and you could measure their vertical leaps and then you could measure the vertical leap of a bunch of people that hadn't been through the training and you can compare those two average vertical leaps against each other. On the other hand, you could take a group of individuals as part of your sample and you could measure their vertical leap. But w these are people that haven't done the training ever. You measure their vertical leap and then you could go back to those same individuals after the training and measure their post-training vertical leap. That way you would pair the data values up. You would pair, pair the pre-training vertical leap versus the post-training vertical leap, and you would come up with a, <coughs> a delta measurement between their vertical leaps there, and, and you would do a test on that. And that would make it much more sensitive because of um, uh, uh, maybe you've got a, a basketball player, a big, tall basketball player, who's got a great vertical leap before the training, and he's improved it even more after the training. And then you've got just a regular... Uh, soccer player type kid who you know maybe it doesn't have the greatest leap because that's not a part of his sport but he wants to take the training anyway to increase his leg strength you could compare his before and after vertical leap there and you would remove the source of variation between the basketball player and the soccer player in that sort of an analysis last but not least you could do the same thing like with a uh, medicine maybe you've come up with a medicine to reduce blood pressure so you could take the same patients record their pre medicine blood pressure and then their post-medicine blood pressure and see what sort of a change that had made in the individuals. That way you would pair up the pre-measurement and the post-measurement in the same individual. Whereas if you didn't want to do that, you could just grab a bunch of people that hadn't taken the medicine, hadn't taken the medicine and measure their blood pressure and take a bunch of other people who have taken the medicine and measure their blood pressure and compare those values to each other. That would include the source of variation that would be a person-to-person -person variation, if you will. So that's it for the uh, discussion on paired versus independent sampling. Thanks for listening.